Hello everyone, I'm David, part of the Australian Student Christian Movement, and we have a special guest with us today. Can you tell us who you are? Hello, I'm Susan Whitfield. I'm a scholar and professor of Silk Road history at the University of East Anglia, and I work on all things Silk Road and have done for decades. So I've traveled a lot, written lots of books, curated exhibitions, um, and other things on the Silk Roads. Excellent. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Excellent. And we have a tradition in Australia where we kind of acknowledge um, the lands on which we meet and acknowledge our elders past, present and emerging. To start with, can you tell us what are the Silk Roads, plural? <laughs> well, let's talk about what the Silk Roads are not first, because that's perhaps easier, because they're often presented as a single route the Silk Road, which goes between Rome and China, between the two ends of Eurasia, the Mediterranean and the Pacific, and trades silk. Well, that's not untrue. There were routes between Rome and China and there was trade in silk, but it wasn't a single route. This was a network of routes that crossed the whole of Eurasia. It's much more complex than a single route. If we think today, the network of trade routes that join us in a global world, you know, going by land and sea and river. There's not one single route. Different routes become important at different times, like Ukrainian grain shipments, for example, at the moment across the Black Sea is a long standing arrangement, but is now uh, threatened by, by military endeavors. It was the same with historical Silk Roads. There's reasons for routes to to be used and reasons for them not to be used, um, geographical, political, whatever. It wasn't just silk. This whole dichotomy, and we'll talk a bit more, I hope have a chance to talk a bit more about the different goods, objects that traveled. The idea of a dichotomy between East and West, I think it's always very dangerous to think of the world in dichotomous binary terms because people are people. And there's no difference between peoples at, um, you know, there, there's, there's merging of, uh, there's, there's a continuum. So there wasn't a, an East and a West, there was a Eurasia with different peoples living along it, many sharing the same ideas, the same faiths, um, the same hopes and dreams, you know, and carrying out the same sorts of lives. So it wasn't these two separate peoples that were joined together by this route. I should say that, of course, the Silk Road didn't exist. This is just a concept we place upon the past, like we place medieval upon the past or the modern era. They're just concepts to help us understand um, historical periods. And what's in, why we use the Silk Road for this historical period, roughly the first millennium AD, the first thousand years, um, is that it's, we think of the world at that point, the Eurasian world, not a global world, but the Eurasian world, Afro-Eurasian world, being having sustained contacts between long distance contacts, trade, diplomacy, all sorts of things, but there were sustained long distance contacts. Doesn't mean that there weren't contacts, long distance contacts before. There's always been long distance contacts between people as, you know, um, Polynesian Islanders or um, Icelandic, um, you know, people in, uh, in um, Scandinavia. There's always been people who've traveled long distances to explore, to, to, to invade other places, to find new resources, new lands to live off. It's just that these were, it was a period of much more sustained contacts between all these places. Um, so it wasn't dominated by any one country. It's not a China thing. Um, and it wasn't just trade. It was also diplomacy. People traveled as we'll discuss for religion, um, for lots of other things. Um, and said it was a network land and sea and river and all sorts of goods. And what are some of the things that actually crossed, you know, ideas, goods that crossed the routes? Yeah, well, of course, Silk Road, silk. Um, it's, I don't think it's a misnomer to use silk in this sense because silk was 
a technology that was cultivated silk, that is taken from domesticated silkworms. Um, it was a technology that was known in East Asia around what we now call China from very, very early times. And during this period, spread to across um, Eurasia. And it didn't just that the silk itself spread, the, the woven goods or, um, or the silk thread, the technology also spread. So all the other cultures going across Eurasia adopted this, learned this technology, just as people do now, because this was a fantastic material. You have to sort of think, if you've never seen silk and you're used to wearing cotton or wool or linen, silk is much more, it's much more lustrous, it's, it's very fine, it's, it's a, a very different material. So when it first came to places, people were amazed by it. And of course, they didn't want to always buy it from other places, they wanted to produce it themselves. So it was also the technology that traveled, not just the objects. And this is why, well, we have mulberry trees across Eurasia because mulberry leaves were used to feed silkworms. Um, technology is quite complex and there were many ups and downs, but it was, yeah. So silk, obviously, all the way across to, you know, the Mediterranean and to Northwest Europe during this period. Um, and then of course, silk went back to China. Um, so it went both ways, but, uh, and silk, I should say, since we're going to be talking more about religions on the Silk Road, was very much used in the churches across the Silk Road. Um, so perhaps we'll get to that. Then there were lots of other manufactured goods, like ceramics is an obvious one. People think of Chinese ceramics, but of course there were ceramics going in both directions. During the Islamic period, Islamic ceramics were very important. Glass, glass was... Um, beads which were made in South Asia, in Indian Sri Lanka, were traded all across the Silk Road. Um, and we find them in England, um, we find them in China, we find them in Scandinavia, we find them everywhere basically, because glass beads are a great trade item, um, but as I said, made in South Asia. Um, but also glass objects, um, you know, vases and, and the like. Glass was a very, again, desirable uh, material. And although many cultures, most cultures learn to make it because it's not, a, the, the materials are readily available. Um, new technologies such as blown glass and everything um, it made it, made new, new objects possible and those became desirable in other cultures. And then there were other materials like ivory from Africa and India, amber from the Baltic, scents like frankincense and agar wood that were used in incense in um, you know, Buddhist and Christian rites, um, a whole lot of semi-precious stones from across the Silk Road. So think of lapis, which came from what is now Afghanistan and still does, jade which came from um, eastern central asia garnet which came from south asia which we find here in britain in medieval brooches um, turquoise all these sorts of semi-precious stones used in jewelry and inlaid work and for small objects foods and plants the grape wine traveled across the silk road grapevine and the making of wine and we find it all the way across and that traveled eastward to to china from um from west asia um and we find wine being used as said in all the cultures almost of the silk road things like alfalfa used to feed horses um was um, it also traveled as a very important uh, crop for, for horses, medicines, um, yeah, all sorts of things like that. Um, and then, of course, there were animals and people. I've mentioned alfalfa used for horses. Horses were very much part of Silk Road trade. They were useful both for um, military purpose, but also for the elite and the elite wanted the finest horses. 
polo was played by many of the courts across the Silk Road. And just as now, when you get racehorses traveling across the world to take part in races, you know, from Australia through to um, Hong Kong, through to um, England, um, then you had horses being trade, traded across, especially breeds that were especially valued um, and breeding programs in new places, but new horses. And they were transported by both land and sea. So horses traveled by ship as well, especially to China, which always had a shortage of horses for various reasons, but desperately needed them. Um, lots of other animals, uh, things like falconry was popular. So falcons were traded among the elites. Um, but then also humans, of course. Uh, we must remember that slave trade, slave trade is not a North Atlantic, didn't start with the North Atlantic slave trade as often presented. Slavery has always been with us as in human societies. So um, we find in almost every single culture across the Silk Roads, across Eurasia, is the slavery. Slavery of either um, often neighboring people, people like prisoners of war taken for slaves, villages raided, for example, along the Eastern Mediterranean for slaves, um, neighboring countries, uh, you know, children um, sold into slavery. So slavery was, uh, slaves were, yeah, humans were a big part of the trade and they traveled, um, yeah, probably the lengths of Silk Road. We have many stories about slaves. Some of them made themselves, got themselves out of slavery and some of them became quite um, important people in their cultures. But of course, that's the tip of the iceberg. The vast majority of slaves probably led very difficult, hard, harsh and short lives. And we mustn't, it's easy to romanticize something like the Silk Road. It sounds like such a romantic notion, but basically it's, you know, it's what humans do. They trade to, to make money to get new goods and slaves are part of that, part, very much part of that story. When it came to trade, were there any rules at all in terms of what could be traded along the routes? Um, yeah, well, we must remember we're talking about over a thousand years of history and 5,000 miles of geography with, you know, scores of different cultures and people. So, yeah, there were. There's, but... Well, there were, you know, there were borders like there are now, there were taxes, a lot of um, traders would have to stop at borders and pay taxes, declare their goods and pay taxes. There were things that were, um, people didn't want to lose, didn't want leaving the country. Um, maps being one of them, international maps, because military secrets. There's a story that often goes around that China tried to stop silk going out of the country, that the secrets of how to produce cultivated silk. You must remember we have uncultivated silk produced in India and produced in some parts in West Asia around the Mediterranean um, earlier than the Silk Road. Um, we're talking about cultivated silk, just like cultivated cattle. You know, silkworms were <clears throat> domesticated and brought up to only to, 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 to produce silk and nothing else. Um, and there are, you know, the story, a lot of Silk Road tales often start with the fact that China didn't want the secret of silk to, to escape the country and so it forbade it. And that there was a princess who was sent to marry um, a king in a foreign land. That was very common. Diplomatic marriages were common. And we know lots of Chinese princesses who were sent to marry Khans or whatever, kings of other countries. But um, this particular princess is said to have wanted to, to, to take her silk clothes and her knowledge. And the king's envoy who came to collect her from um, the center of the Chinese plains said to her, you know, we don't have silk in our country. You'll have to wear wool or cotton or whatever. 
And she said, oh, no, 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 no. I mean, this is a story. And, um, and so she, the story goes, hid silk cocoons, cocoons that the um, silk moths weaved, which the caterpillars come out of with the, um, uh, and she um, put these in her headdress, in her elaborate headdress, and that she took individuals, her maidservants were people who knew about silk weaving and um, everything, and that she wasn't searched at the border, and so she got the secret of silk out of China. Well, it's a lovely story, and um, but we know from historical records that China shared with its neighbors how to produce silk and often sent silk experts at the very beginning of the Silk Road to neighboring countries to teach them about sericulture, about the production of silk. Um, and so, you know, that, that's, that's one of the stories. So we have to be careful because lots of stories come up about things that were forbidden. And of course, if you had uh, something that was very valuable, then the then the elite, the court, the rulers might try to keep control of it um, because they wanted it, you know, they didn't want something very valuable, just as today when there's, um, I don't know, certain things, um, especially certain minerals or whatever used in um, technology, people don't want them leaving the country. They want to have control over, um, over them and, and be able to use them fantastic horses, certain medicines, you know, things like this. But on the whole, yeah, as far as we can tell, and what we can tell is limited, as we'll get on to because of the evidence we have, or the evidence we don't have. Um, on the whole, it seems as if, well, things certainly travelled every, you know, we don't know a great blockage of things that didn't travel at any point. So can you tell us a little bit more about the religions that travelled across the pilgrimages? Yeah, well, religions were a very, very important part because, of course, of the Silk Road story. We're talking about, with the Silk Road story, we're talking about people on the whole traveling, whether they're traveling for diplomatic reasons, for, you know, um, whether they're traveling because they don't have any choice as slaves, whether they travel to marry a foreign ruler, whether they travel for trade, whatever reason, whether they're forced out as migrants, as prisoners, um, you know, by war or whatever. Um, and they, of course, took their ideas, which included their faiths. Now, at the start of the Silk Road, we already have Zoroastrianism and Buddhism um, in um, Asia. But neither of those are proselytizing faiths, so although they traveled because people were pushed out of places or um, settled in other places, they didn't travel because people went deliberately to, to, to convert. But Buddhism, Christianity, Manichaeanism and Islam, which are all faiths that we see during this Silk Road period, were all proselytizing faiths and we see them all spread um, across much of the Silk Roads. I mean, if we look at Buddhism, which is the earliest of those uh, faiths from about the fifth century BC. So it was already well established by the start of the Silk Road by, you know, by about um, first century BC, first century AD. And it traveled, oh, I mean, we know of its travels across into Central and then into East Asia, as far as Japan and Korea, all of which became Buddhist countries and down into Southeast Asia. And it almost certainly traveled into West Asia and to Iran and some evidence of Buddhism in Turkey, for example, on the shores of the Mediterranean. Um, Christianity then, of course, also traveled especially the Church of the East, sometimes called Nestorian Christianity. Um, <clears throat> and we have Christian sites in, for example, what is now Western, Northwestern China um, from that period and Christian texts. Manichaeanism, um, Mani from the fourth century Iranian prophet also traveled. And then of course, um, eastward, Islam, which was very important faith from um, the latter part of the Silk Road, um, also um, greatly affected the Silk Road story. And 
I should say all these faiths manifested themselves not only in individual conversion and faith, but also, of course, in the books and the texts and the art and the architecture. Um, so we have remains from all those things. So we have a very, very rich faith landscape, if you like. We mustn't forget that all these places that they went to had their own faiths already, or they had their own um, beliefs and religions often grouped a lot of those early religions are sometimes grouped together rather unhelpfully as shamanism because that suggests there was one faith but um, you know beliefs and um, that, that practices that existed among different peoples and those probably continued um, but certainly there were large communities of these other faiths we see at different times um, across the Silk Road, and they would have great um, influence on, I said, all things such as, you know, books, art, architecture, people's lives, obviously. Um, and, and so, yeah, that's, I said, a very, very much part of the story and one that's, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's often forgotten how all those faiths, a lot of the places along the Silk Road were multi-faith places. They, you know, people lived together, different communities of faiths in many of the cities of the Silk Road. So Chang'an, for example, had Zoroastrian, it had a Nestorian temple, it had a Manichaean temple, it had Buddhist, it had Taoist, it had Confucian. You know, in the city, there were all these religions that lived alongside each other um, on the whole. So it wasn't as if one faith came to most places and pushed others out. They, in many places in the Silk Road story, they lived alongside each other um, and said often, new faiths were taken by um, groups that were relocated to places. Um, so, so we see a great, I guess, interaction and cross, there's a certain amount of cross influence of faiths at that time. Um, but it is, it is very much a, a picture of numerous faiths. Yeah, and we're looking at the Silk Road. And this will vary, of course, depending on the person, but can you give us an idea of what it was actually like traveling along the routes for people, the kind of practicality? Yeah, of it? well, you think of travel today, okay? You go to get on your plane and then you have a delay and you have to queue a long time and then, you know, you can't find anywhere to stay when you get there and, or it's, travel is, the, the yeah, well, let's think first who was traveling. So there were diplomatic travelers, as there are today, you know, diplomatic missions going from the elites of all the different countries. And they obviously have probably had the most comfortable travel because they were the elite. They would go with, in a group, they would have, you know, escorts to take them. They would have letters of invitation. When they got to a new land, they'd probably be accompanied, you know, to, to the court. They would be given lots of gifts and food and everything along their way. So that was, but still, we you know, many diplomats who encountered, for example, were problems en route. Uh, there were problems, I mean, you might come across. We're talking about travel along long distances and, and difficult geography. So if you're crossing a desert, there's many things that can go wrong. If you're going over a mountain route. If you're crossing a river by a little bridge, you know, it can get swept away. And then there's also things like, of course, bandits, thieves along the route. Um, and there were, wherever there's people traveling with, um, with potentially um, goods of value, items of value, there'll be thieves. So we have many reports, but okay, if you're diplomatic travel, traveler, you would probably travel by horseback. You wouldn't walk. You would travel in a convoy. You would have a whole lot of people um, alongside to help for your needs. We have one report, for example, this was of a military traveler, but a general who was going off to fight in the 
northwest, um, to the northwest of China, who so much, he came from the coast and he so much loved fresh fish that he had tanks of seawater placed on the backs of camels so they could take fish along the route so he could have fresh fish. But that's an extreme. Most people didn't have that. So, you know, that's your luxury travel, if you like. But you're still on horseback. You, there's no train, plane, automobile. You're still going along on horseback um, across difficult terrain. And you might, there were places to stop en route. The idea of caravanserai, amazingly, in the western part of the Silk Road and mainly later from the Islamic period, but there were certainly places to stop. A lot of them government, um, government led, so that there would be some safety, some place to get water, some place to get food. But then as you go down from your diplomats, who, as I said, were also not entirely safe, then for your merchants, your pilgrims, um, who were going on long journeys with a purpose, you know, the merchants for trade and the pilgrims to reach a place or to go, I mean, normally they were stopping places on the route as for the merchants, you know, it wasn't that you just went from China to India to visit the sites of Buddha. You went from China to different monasteries and stupas and shrines en route, the same as if you were going from Northwest Europe to Jerusalem, there were shrines set up en route that you would stop, stop at. And the same merchants would stop at, they wouldn't just go you know, from A to B, unless they were going by sea, of course, but if they're going by land, they would stop at market towns en route to carry out trade. So, you know, they might want to carry out, go to a certain place. Ooh, a bit of a place a long distance away to get some specific items. So, um, so merchants and pilgrims, if they were rich enough, would also travel by horse or perhaps by donkey. They would have camels, yaks, depending where they were to carry their goods, you know, they might take tents to, to camp in places, but they would hope also to stop in, um, in small settlements and towns. Pilgrims would obviously stop at, um, at monasteries if they could. And we have nice reports, for example, from quite a few, well, both Buddhist and Christian pilgrims and later Islamic pilgrims. We have quite a lot of pilgrimage accounts telling us about um, about journeys and um, how they were set up. And journeys which, pilgrimages which were well trodden, um, became more organized um, over time, as I said, which had stopping places en route, then shrines en route, you know, so that you could, um, you could punctuate your journey. And when you got to the place, it was, you know, um, um, the Holy City of Jerusalem or the um, Buddha's birthplace, then there was a whole, oh, well, like today, you go to any place, you know, there's people who, uh, there were places to stay, there were places selling you um, lots of, um, we have things like pilgrimage badges and things, people, just as now, I mean, if you travel around Japan or whatever, you get stamps at all the temples, you know, on, you know a little book, and you can um, buy various pilgrimage, what should we call it, um, paraphernalia um, to take home, to give to people bits, you know, holy water or case of Buddha, some bits of the, you know, um, relics, whatever, um, pilgrim badges, other things. So there was more and more infrastructure. But even so, it, it was tough. We, we were traveling, you know, how far do we walk in a day normally? We don't walk day after day for miles or ride horseback day after day for miles over very challenging terrain into places where you know, there's people speaking other languages and everything. So, um, yeah, and we have numerous reports of pilgrims being, encountering problems 
for example, Xuanzang, who was a Chinese pilgrim on his way back from India, his camels with all the manuscripts, scriptures that he had collected in India, some of them, um, not camels, elephants, um, were were swept away in flood water when he was trying to traverse one of the rivers. So things like that, just, but it's, you know, it's the same as today, only you were traveling for a lot, lot longer time. You're traveling for months, possibly a year or more, but certainly for weeks and months to go to these places. So um, the, the possibilities of things going wrong were much greater just because it was a much longer journey. And what's the evidence that we have about the silk uh, routes? I know you mentioned that there are pilgrim accounts and things like that, but what's the kind of the archaeological evidence that we have about what happened? Yeah, well, of course, it's working in this period, the first millennium AD. Um, there are quite a lot of historical texts, but historical texts, well, of, you know, they tell us a story of the elite. They tell us the 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 a, a certain story of a very small sector of society, and I should say the male elite. Women don't feature much in you know um, received texts in those sorts of texts. Fortunately, due to a couple of archaeological finds, we have great tranches of texts which are more ephemeral texts, texts which weren't intended to be kept. Um, and thinking of something like the Cairo Geniza, um, obviously a great horde of texts found in Cairo, um, and in the other end of the Silk Road, uh, the library cave at Dunhuang, both which produced were hordes of thousands and thousands of texts, which included many um, scriptures, but also uh, included lots of ephemeral documents as well. So we see, we gain a lot from those. So we have, oh, all sorts of things. Um, uh, you know, um, and I can go into that in a bit more, but let's, so so in terms of texts, we do have a certain amount of, certain number of, of sort of more ephemeral documents to to make the story, to flesh out the story that we have, the rather stark elite story we have from the main text. But then of course, we also have lots and lots of archeology span from various points. We have to be careful because in, for example, in what is now Northwest China, but the Eastern Silk Road is a big desert area and the Silk Road went in the north and south of the desert. The routes went to the north and south along oasis towns. But a lot of material has survived because it's very dry there, it's desert. And so we have lots of textiles and lots of wood and lots of material that otherwise in other places has disappeared. So for example, in India, we have no textiles. It doesn't mean there weren't textiles produced and traded in India. In fact, we know there were, but they just haven't survived because it's too wet and humid. So we have to be very careful when dealing with archeology span because we find wonderful things. But the fact that in some places, in fact, we don't find them in other places doesn't mean they don't exist. It's I mean, it's, you know, it's all serendipity what is found and it's very patchy. It's like having, I guess, you know, you have 20 pieces of a thousand piece jigsaw and you have to try to imagine what the whole jigsaw is showing from your 20 pieces that are scattered around um, the board. So over the past, well, since the 19th century, late 19th century and over the 20th century, there's been lots and lots and into the 21st um, of archaeology uncovering some of the major towns, the major um, monasteries, churches, uh, wonderful old churches, Buddhist, Christian monasteries, um, old cities, um, and of course, things like caravanserai, more ephemeral places with some of them with fantastic finds. I would say there's probably, even though these are just, as I said, your 20 pieces of a 10,000 piece, probably jigsaw, there's still more, we have more stuff than has been looked at yet. 
I mean, if any of the listeners here want to get into scholarship, this is a great area because there's lots and lots of material which, um, which still needs to be explored and understood. So, you know, we think, I mean, there's relatively little material compared to what there would have been, but there's still a lot of material. So for example, the Dunhuang Archive Library Cave, which had 50,000 manuscripts in it, um, dating from the fourth, to 11th centuries and paintings, but of those manuscripts, probably a tenth or fewer have been um, have been studied. So in detail, you know, there's this. We still have an. What I'm really saying is, we have a very, in a sense, sparse record. But that sparse record is still yet to be fully explored and understood. And new items are constantly coming up, of course, constantly being found. Um, so it's, you know, this, it's, it's like lots of areas of, of historical, archeological scholarship um, need more individuals to work on this material um, so we can learn more things. And there's still many, many more things to be learned. And it's a joy to work on this material because it takes us into people's lives and we learn about people's lives. I mentioned about elite documents. Let me just give you one example of the sort of counterpoint we have to that from the finds at Dunhuang, which I worked on for many, many years. Um, we have a letter. This wasn't found in the library cave. This, this was a letter found at the border post between China and Central Asia. And it dates from about early fourth century, about 303 AD. And it's a letter written by a woman who's a merchant's wife. And she's from Samarkand, from one of those great cities in what is now Uzbekistan, Central Asia, great trading cities. And the peoples in those cities, um, the Sogdians who ruled that area at that time were great traders of the Silk Road. They came all the way to the Black Sea and all the way to China. Um, and her husband and she have moved to this distant town. I mean, it's, you know, well over a thousand miles, a different place, different language, different culture, just as somebody might move today to, um, you know, for, for their job. They've moved to this different town for, for his work. <coughs> And he's got into debt when he's been there. Um, they have a child, they have a daughter. He's got into debt and he can't pay back his debt. And what he does is he flees, leaving her and his daughter back in this place in Dunhuang. And he flees back to Samarkand to escape his debtors. And she's writing to him. She might well have been literate. A lot of Sogdian women and other women were at that time. Um, and she's sending a letter back to Samarkand. And she's saying, you know, I married you and my mother and my brothers told me I shouldn't and advised me against it, but I ignored them. And I came with you to this distant land and then you got into debt and, um, and all your debtors were chasing you and you fled and left, abandoned us in this, you know, foreign place. And we know there was a community because she said, I went to the head of the Sogdian community, but he can't help me. So I'm forced to become a, a servant in a Chinese household so I can make enough money for myself and daughter to live. And then she gets more and more irate in this letter. And she says, I'd rather be a dog's wife or a pig's wife than yours <laughs> at the end. And she sends this letter off. But I mean, two things. The first is, this letter never reached her husband because it was found just about 20 miles up the road in <clears throat> 1907, excuse me, um, by an archaeologist. I don't know, at the border post. There weren't postmen at that time. You'd have given the letter to a fellow Sogdian trader who was on his way back home, who would have come through your town en route back to, to Samarkand. And he had a satchel of letters, some of them from the capital of China at the time um, and various you know, places where there were Sogdian communities all the way. 
and he was taking these letters back for his fellow countrymen. Um, for whatever reason, he might have been attacked by bandits, perhaps he had a heart attack, perhaps he just took off his satchel and forgot it, but we don't know. But it lay there from 303 AD until 1907 when it was rediscovered and it was in the sands, so very dry, covered by sand, um, and all the letters, which are on paper, because we have paper in, um, in that part of the world at this time, um, survived. So we get this little glimpse into this woman's life, which we can, I think, all totally identify with, especially as women, you know, we can all understand that story. It's a story that happens today. People go, you know, move abroad, they get abandoned. Um, they, they, they are forced to, you know, try to find a way to support themselves. I should say the letter also has a little aside from the daughter. Um, the woman's name is Mine, um, from the daughter just saying, Daddy, we want to come home. It's sort of a very poignant letter. We have no idea what happened to this woman. But the point I'm really making is she's never going to appear in any sort of official history or text. She's not an important person in terms of those texts. You know, she's not a general. She's not a leader. She's not a princess. She's, she's just an ordinary woman living her life. But thanks to the serendipity of this find and the desert, um, we have a glimpse into her life and we must remember that her life represents tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of similar lives along the Silk Road. So uh, the, the, the finds we have, the archaeological finds we have, just give us that link, that's why I love working on them in a way, back to the individuals of the past. And we can all empathize with them. Humans share the same hopes, the same ambitions, the same sufferings, you know, wherever they live at whatever time. And you, you get glimpses of this in the few remaining objects that there are like that letter. It just opens um, your eyes to, to a world that was taking place beyond the generals and the leaders and all these other people who <coughs> take central place in the in the official histories so um yeah thank you so much uh, for doing this for us <laughs> it's a great talk thank you no it's a great pleasure thank you <laughs>